chapter number three. It's in between Nahum and Zephaniah, toward the back of your Old Testament. You got an old Schofield, it's on page 957. If you don't have an old Schofield, you're on your own. Habakkuk chapter number three. Now, I will say this, uh, and I said this this morning, a lot of times when you're reading the Bible, because this is way back in the back, if you don't know the chronological order of what's going on in the Scripture, you fail to realize that Jeremiah and Habakkuk and Nehemiah and Ezra and a lot of these fellows were prophets and preachers and ministers at the same time. And uh, because Habakkuk is a minor prophet, doesn't mean that he was any less used of God than one of the major prophets. His message was just as true and just as important. And uh, Habakkuk has a wonderful message for us tonight. Chapter number 3. We'll begin our reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shigeonoth, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known, in wrath remember mercy. And God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless you. We thank you for, again for this grand privilege. God, thank you for the good singing, the good song, and thank you, Lord, for the day when you touched me. Lord, thank you that not only did you touch us with salvation, but God, I'm glad from time to time you come by and you touch us again. You remind us of how great you are. Now, Father, I thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you for answering prayer. And thank you for being a great God. God, I am glad that regardless of the situation, you work in them and through them. And God, you get glory to your name. Lord, no matter how dire something may look, Lord, nothing is impossible with thee. And that, God, you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Now, help us now. Lord, speak to our hearts. Lord, you've arranged the atmosphere for the service for this message. Now, Father, enlighten our minds, encourage the saints of God, edify us that, Lord, when we leave, we will leave different than we came in. We'll leave with a greater understanding of the things of God, and, Lord, we'll leave with revival in our hearts. Help us now, and we'll thank you for it. Use this unworthy vessel, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Habakkuk, in his days, was much like our days. They mirrored our days. His day was days full of anarchy, full of apostasy, and full of apathy. Uh, there was anarchy because there was no law, or there was lawlessness in the land because they'd walked away from the law of God. They'd worship false gods, and a uh, man done what was right in his own eyes, uh, and they had become uh, just a, a generation of anarchy, and that's why God was sending judgment upon Israel because of how they treated him and his law. But it's also a day of apostasy. Apostasy is the final stages of sin, and Israel had come to the point where they'd finally crossed God's deadline, and judgment was going to befall them, and they was going to be uh, overthrown, and uh, they were going to suffer persecution because they ignored what thus saith the Lord. Uh, and can I say even those that uh, knew the law of God and uh, went through the motions of uh, worship, uh, uh, the apathy had fallen on them to where they were just doing it out of a sense of duty rather than doing it from their heart. And can I say in our day, we live in a day too where uh, a man does not want anything to do with what thus saith the Lord. Uh, we live in a day of anarchy, lawlessness when it comes to righteousness and holiness. Uh, a, a man wants to do what's right in his own eyes. Uh, man wants to tell you that we're not allowed to judge them, but they want to judge you on what you believe based on the Bible. Uh, 
We live in a day and age uh, uh, where all the things of God are becoming a mockery, uh, 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 where folks worship uh, the creature more than the creator. Uh, and when they change the glory uh, of God into the image uh, of man himself, uh, we live in a day of anarchy. We live in a day of apostasy as it's already been brought out. Uh, uh, some of the things uh, that are transpiring in our day, I would have never dreamed were even possible, let alone people would uh, exercise those things. Uh, but we uh, are to the point, even in our nation, uh, where we're about ready to cross the deadline with God. we have uh, about ready to cross that place where God uh, sends strong judgment against America, uh, where st God sends strong judgment against the nations for how they've dealt with Israel. Uh, we live in a day of apostasy and then even apathy has hit our churches we come we sit down we get up we go home but there's never any change we're just apathetic to the things of God it's not uh, what thus saith the Lord it's just the pastor and his opinions we're apathetic we don't take to heart that the message came from God and God it's trying to deal with me. No, somebody else needs it. We can live in sin. We can live with bitterness. I don't know how many times I've preached on bitterness since the first year. We can have bitterness against somebody in the church. Bitterness against God. Bitterness in... And we can uh, so try to justify our situation. We'll come to church. But nothing ever changes in our life. We're apathetic. So we have the same things going on in our lives that people had going on in Habakkuk's days. I want you to notice something in these verses we read as a way of introduction. I want you to notice, first of all, the place of Habakkuk. Look again in verse number 1. It says, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shigianoth. Now, most Bible scholars, and that's why I don't care what most Bible scholars say, because they're wrong. I found that uh, you know, I've got about 14 or 15 different sets of commentaries, and that's not counting what software I have online and all my computers. But I'll say this about somewhere along the line, somebody had an original thought, and then most of them just rewrote everything that person said. Amen. But what most Bible scholars will tell you, that word shigenoth uh, uh, is a song because there was a, a, a phrase used very similar to it in one of the Psalms of David. I believe it's Psalm 7. And so they say, hey, Habakkuk singing uh, uh, this song. Well, there's just a problem with that. That's not what God says in this verse. Habakkuk's not singing. It says that Habakkuk, the man of God, prayed upon Shigenoth. It wasn't really a mountain, but it was a, a very uh, large hillside that he had elevated himself to try and get a hold of God. But uh, what I want you to understand, the place of Habakkuk is what that word means. And if you've uh, been around here long enough, sat under my preaching, teaching long enough, you know the names of people and the names of places uh, uh, in the Old Testament especially uh, are very symbolic and they have something to do with the location or that individual. Uh, and in study you can find out uh, some insight to what's going on. Uh, and we find that uh, this uh, place, uh, Shigenoth, uh, it means irregular. And he's at an irregular place. Uh, it's not normal where he's at. Uh, and I say thanks be unto God when people get away from what's normal because uh, what's normal's not been working. Uh, just going through the routine doesn't get the job done. Uh, uh, we need something irregular. Uh, we need something unusual. Uh, we need something supernatural. Uh, we're ever going to turn the tide of what's going on in our day and age. Amen. You know, I say revival doesn't come in a person, doesn't come in a preacher, doesn't come in a message. Revival comes as a change of heart as a result of a message given by a man who preaches what thus saith the Lord. Yes, so we see the place of Habakkuk was irregular. As long as you are fixed on being normal, you'll never get help from God. That's why I do appreciate some of you moving around. Some of you move every service. I really don't like it because I can't find you while I'm preaching. You know, some of you are really confusing. Before service, I shook hands with Miss Lisa. She's sitting over there, and now she's over there. Double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. You don't even know where to sit, lady. Huh? Find a place and plan it, okay? Huh? Got me all confused, huh? 
But uh, by moving around, you, what you're doing is uh, you're not getting satisfied where you are. You're confusing the devil. Amen. But it's kind of weird when you get to moving around because you get used to hearing the sound and how it affects where you sit. When you move somewhere else, it, everything sounds different, looks different. And, you know, but listen, well, I'm not talking about just moving around. I'm talking about not getting in a rut. Right. Not getting to the place to where you don't appreciate worship and what thus saith the Lord. Amen. We see it was an irregular place. Notice the prayer of Habakkuk. He says in verse number 2, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember mercy. And can I say in his prayer, he ended this prayer if you've heard me ever pray and occasionally I'll say that very phrase because one day when I was reading this God pinned it in my heart in wrath remember mercy can I say God would be justified wiping everybody off the face of the earth but in his wrath he does remember mercy why does God not do that because there's still people that he wants to save there's still lives he wants to change there's still churches he wants to revive. There's still a need for God to shed his grace upon man. We see the prayer of Habakkuk, but notice the praise of Habakkuk. Look in verse number three. And God came from Teman, and I wish I could deal with these places. I don't have time tonight. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. I mean, stop and think about that. I'm glad God came from where he was to where we needed him to. Mm. Look what happens. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. I would to God that he'd get so big that the earth would be full of his praise. Um, there's a whole lot we could look at in these verses. But I'm interested in verse number two tonight. I'm interested in the prayer of Habakkuk. And I want to preach with God's help on a passionate prayer. On a passionate prayer. Can I say Habakkuk is praying from his heart in verse number 2. If you're not careful, most of our prayers are repetitious. Most of our prayers are selfish. Most of our prayers have an agenda and it's not Jesus. Most of our prayer time is wasting God's time. Most of our prayer is about us having a more comfortable and an easier life. Most of our prayer has nothing to do with eternity. Has nothing to do with with souls not dying and going to hell has nothing to do with God getting glory most of our prayer dishonors God matter of fact in the average Baptist church you know within a very short span of time what five guys are going to call on to pray and after you've heard them all pray a couple of times you can pray their prayer because they're saying the same thing every time can I say, even in our churches, there are some people when they pray, I know what they're going to pray for before they pray. Because they say the same thing. The Bible tells us and warns us against vain and rep uh, repetitious prayers. Yet, people do that. You know why? Because they don't pray passionately. They don't pray from their heart. They're praying from their head. They're praying what they've rehearsed. Instead of yielding themselves to the Holy Ghost, like it tells us in Romans chapter number 8, where you pray in the Spirit, and when the Spirit Himself uh, intercedes with groanings and utterings that cannot be comprehended or understood. We don't pray that way. We pray things that are important to us. We pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. We pray, Lord, help me to pay my bills. We pray, Lord, help me to do this. Lord, give me this shopping list worth of stuff. And God, give me this shopping list worth of stuff. And very rarely do we ever pray that God gets glory and the earth would be full of his praise. 
we throw off on the Catholics. They have what they call a rosary. If you don't know anything about that, that's a blessing. But the rosary is a strand of beads in a circle. And in that rosary, they have to uh, pray whatever the priest has told them to pray in order to get repentance for their sins. Uh, they have to pray so many Hail Marys. Uh, and that's a specific prayer that they pray. Uh, and every time they pray it, they count their little bead, they flip it on around and on around, and they know how many times they've got to say it. Uh, and if it's not that, they've got to pray the Our Fathers, uh, which is uh, 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 calling out the model prayer of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 when he said, Our Father, which art in heaven, uh, hallowed be thy name. Uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, all that stuff. They're praying repetitiously uh, because they're saying, That's the prayer of the Lord. Uh, no, that was the model. That was the teaching. They said, the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. He said, pray after this manner. He didn't say pray that prayer. Uh, the Lord's prayer was John chapter 17. Uh, wasn't Matthew chapter number 6. Uh, uh, but they pray repetitiously. And they pray the same thing. Uh, hey, even their priests don't know how to pray. They read their prayers. Uh, and not only them, but many other the dom denominational churches uh, read their prayers. I, I, it just blows me away. You can ask my wife, uh, uh, when, uh, in the school settings a lot of times the banquets they'll ask me if I'll uh, uh, ask the blessing before they eat uh, so I get up and I pray uh, and they come and say that was wonderful I, I've never heard anything like what was you doing I was praying is what I was doing I wasn't reading it I have been there when I asked somebody else to pray and they pull out a card or a piece of paper and unfold it so they can read it there's no passion behind it and can I say, most of our prayer is not passionate. Most of our prayer in the eyes of God is sickening. And so let's look at this verse and see a passionate prayer. See what is going on here. And maybe we can glean and get some help so it affects our prayer life. Because we are exhorted to pray. We are exhorted to bring our petitions before God. We are exhorted to pray. He says, you have not because you ask not. But then he goes on to say, and when you ask, you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. Well, this passionate prayer is not a selfish prayer. Well, notice a few things about this prayer. I want you to notice, first of all, the acknowledgement in Habakkuk's prayer. The acknowledgement in his prayer. Look again in verse number 2. He says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech. Now that's very important. It's very important because he's acknowledging God in his prayer. Why is that important? We'll go back to chapter number 1. You see, in chapter number 1 we find Habakkuk praying like we pray a lot of times. In chapter number 1 and verse number 2, Notice he starts the prayer the same way. He says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. In this prayer, he's praying selfishly. He's actually indicting God. He's saying, God, I prayed and I prayed and you won't answer my prayer. How long do I got to keep praying before you answer? I've even cried out about the violence and thou wilt not save. Uh, hey, that's kind of like how we pray. Yeah, God, I keep praying for this and you haven't given it to me. I keep praying for this loved one. I keep praying about this thing. And God, when are you ever going to move on this thing? Uh, you're answering Lawrence's prayer. You're answering Tommy's prayer. How come you're not answering me, Lord? What about me? Uh, and he's praying selfishly here. He's indicting God. He's actually tempting God in this chapter. But by the time we get to chapter number 3, look what he says. He's no longer using the same tone. He's no longer saying, Lord, how long? Lord, you haven't answered. Lord, uh, I've cried and you haven't come to soothe my, my cry. He's acting like a little baby in chapter number 1. Why, 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 give me a bottle. But look in chapter number 3. O Lord, I have heard thy speech. 
He acknowledges God in this prayer. You know what he's acknowledging? He said, Lord, now I've heard from you. You know why we pray selfishly, why we pray repetitiously, why we pray and it's sickening unto God? Because we don't hear what God says. We're not listening to God in order to get the mind of God that we know how to pray. We just pray. Because we've, you know, heard everything that the charismatics say, that if two or three are gathering his name, we can ask anything in his name, he'll do it. And uh, as touching one thing in agreement, God's going to do it. Name it and claim it and all this stuff. And we just think God's going to cater down and bow down to us because we're so special. He said, I've heard thy speech. He's acknowledging God now. God, I now have heard from you. Can I say God is always speaking? But the Bible says in the last days there will be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. See, God speaks, but so many of God's people say, well, that's just the preacher's opinion. All the preacher's just trying to, he's just trying to do that to, you know, get to me. Well, I'll show him. I ain't going to listen to him. And all the while, God's trying to get our attention, but we ignore God. We ignore God's man. We ignore God's word. We don't study his word. We don't read his word. We don't meditate on his word. We don't let God speak to us. But we sure do want God to answer us. God will never hear our prayers while we're regarding iniquity in our heart and we're regarding iniquity in our heart if we don't take time to listen to see what he's saying. You know what prayers God answers? God answers the prayers that God lays on our heart to pray. When you pray scripturally or you pray in the very will of God, what God tells you to pray, He's going to answer that prayer. When God tells you what to pray to God, then God's going to answer what God told you to pray. He acknowledges God in chapter number 3. Now let me say something about when God answers. See, in the first part, he's in the first prayer in chapter number 1, He's indicting God for not answering Him. How long wilt thou not hear? I have cried unto thee about the violence and the spoil thou hast not saved. Let me tell you something about the answers from God. An answer from God may be very direct. You may pray and God may answer immediately. Matter of fact, there's been times when I've been praying and got alone with God and be calling on God. To, and before I get to the amen, he's already gave me peace and assurance in my prayer that, hey, he's oh, got it all under control. And he answers directly. He answers right on the spot. Sometimes he answers that way. He answers directly. Sometimes God answers might be delayed. Sometimes it might be delayed. Sometimes God just says not now. I, I told this this morning. I'm thankful God has answered prayer and he's going to allow us to have a building from the mission. Can I say when the opportunity for this building first came, it was in the ways of a purchase, and if we would have purchased it, the mortgage on this building would have been over $3,000 a month. And we just couldn't afford that. Well, uh, somebody else bought it, and just a couple weeks after they bought it, they knew we were interested, and they knew we was more interested in leasing it rather than buying it. Uh, and uh, uh, they sent a proposal to us where they wanted us to lease it uh, uh, for five years, uh, and it was still going to cost us about $1,800 to $1,900 a month. You have to understand, the men had already met, and, and we'd already determined what we thought we could afford. And eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars a month wasn't for five years. It was absolutely asinine. Can anybody in here tonight tell me where you're going to be and what you're going to do five years from now? No. That's why you got to pray and ask God because a lot of times you write your name on a line to pay payments on a car for five years. You better get God's will on all that. Are you listening? Hmm? If God says and gives you peace, and buy it. But if He don't. Don't. So when I met with the men and showed them the proposal, uh, and I just let them know uh, 
You know, fellas, here it is, but I, I, I know there's wisdom in the multitude of counsel, and that's why you're here. I have all, all respect for you, and this is what's going on. I said, really? I said, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a peace about this. Hmm? Our associate pastor was in there, and he said, well, preacher, if you don't have peace on it, we're, we're done talking as far as I'm concerned. You're the man of God. If you don't have peace, we don't do it. But one of the trustees said, preacher, it sounds like a great opportunity. sounds like it's wonderful. But there's a problem. You don't have peace. It's more than we can afford. He said, you've taught us many times that God says yes, no, or not now as far as I'm concerned. Hey, maybe someday, but not now. And that's what we went back and told them. Doesn't work for us. It wasn't a week later. Realtor called me. He said, hey, Understand there's a problem because of the term of the lease. You don't want to pay on it for five years and the price of it. And, and what would you like to do? So I said, I don't want to go over a year. I said, I don't want to pay that much. He went and talked to them. They came back. They said, here's what they'll do. One year for $1,000 a month. He said, what happened? We said, sold. Sometimes God delays. And we could have jumped in and it would have cost us three times as much. Or you can wait on God to answer the prayer and God gets it where you need it. Are you listening? And I'm just going to tell you right now, you're not going to find a 3,000 square foot building with a private parking lot already set up as a church and they decided to leave us the pews in Newport for $1,000 a month. You can't do it, but God did. Sometimes the answer will be delayed. Sometimes it's direct. Sometimes the answer is denied. Sometimes God says no. Now I know we don't like that because we're Americans and we're spoiled and we think we should get everything. But sometimes God says no. Amen. Say why? Because he knows what's best. Hmm. And I'm glad when God says no, he's not like a lot of our earthly fathers. When he tells little Johnny, no. And little Johnny keeps whining and says, all right, but only this one time. No, when God says no. When God closes a door, no man can open it. When he opens a door, no man can close it. Sometimes he denies. But then sometimes an answer from God may be different. Sometimes he may be working in the shadows and give us an answer different than what we expected or what we wanted. Again, he's God. He knows what he's doing. He always does all things well and he knows what's best. And sometimes the answer is different than what we expected. How many times have we said his ways are not our ways? He works in mysterious ways and sometimes his answer is totally different than what we expected. In chapter number 1, Habakkuk didn't know about all this, but now he's praying passionately. He's praying in the will of God. He acknowledges God, and he acknowledges the answer is now come. Can I say, in this passionate prayer, we see the acknowledgement in Habakkuk's prayer. But I want you to notice the approach in Habakkuk's prayer. Remember, in chapter number 1, he's indicting God. But look in chapter number 3 again, verse number 2. O Lord... I have heard thy speech and was afraid. Can I say, if you ever really hear the voice of God and that still small voice, it'll make you afraid. John the Baptist, when he met Jesus and he really heard the voice of God, you know what he said? He said, I must decrease and he must increase. Three places in the Bible you see where man saw the glorified Christ and when he saw the glorified Christ he fell as he were before him as a dead man. In a passionate prayer if you truly hear the speech of the Lord you truly hear God speaking to you through his word through his servant through the spirit of God it will cause you to be afraid. Who are we that God would speak to? He's not indicting God now. Now he's fearful of God. If you don't believe that, look down at verse 16 of this same chapter. Look what he said. He said, when I heard, 
I would to God we'd start listening to God in the services. Hmm? I would to God it wouldn't be the preacher's voice, it wouldn't be the singer singing, it wouldn't be the piano player playing the piano, it wouldn't be somebody shaking our hands in fellowship. I would to God we'd come and we'd listen for God. The Bible says, seek and you shall find. If you come to church seeking to hear God, you're going to hear Him. Huh? He said, when I heard, my belly trembled. Uh, my lips qui quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself. Uh, he said, when I really heard from God, uh, I realized that I was unclean, like Isaiah in chapter number 6 of Isaiah. Uh, he said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Uh, when we truly hear God, uh, we'll tremble and quake before him. Uh, we'll be careful not to utter foolishness. He said, my lips quivered. Uh, my belly trembled. Uh, I felt rottenness in, his, in my bones. Uh, when we hear him, uh, the voice of many thunderings, and realize how holy he is, and we don't deserve to hear from him. Uh, we realize uh, we're just sinners uh, saved by the grace of God uh, and we feel guilty and unclean and unworthy before him. Uh, we see his approach now is different because he's heard from God. You remember after Peter failed the Lord and Peter did what came natural to the flesh, he said, I'm going fishing. When they're out there on the boat, Jesus is on the shore. They're out there trying to catch fish. Jesus already has them caught, cleaned, and frying in the pan. He says, children, have you any meat? And they're looking around. Now keep in mind, he's now the glorified Lord. He's not the broken shell beaten up on Calvary. He's risen from the dead. And John said, I don't recognize that fella, but I know his voice. John said, it's the Lord. And when Peter realized it was the Lord, he jumped off the ship in the water. Why? He wasn't clean. Uh, he realized, I don't deserve the Lord to talk to me in the state I'm in. Uh, and he jumped overboard. He didn't want the Lord to see him. Uh, when we hear the Lord, we realize we're unkept and we're not what we should be. Uh, and we fear and tremble before him. Amen. Uh, Peter finally gets out of the water. He comes up there and the Lord probably gave him the best piece of fish he had. And just knowing the Lord. And he said, where did the Lord catch the fish? He just told, hey, fish get out of the water. And they come up on the ground. And he just put them on the, hey, that's the, the Lord commanded one to spit up some money to pay his taxes. You didn't think he'd tell me, hey, get out of here. Get in the pan. But just knowing the Lord. Brother Donovan, it was probably Peter's favorite fish. Ah. Uh, I don't know if it was grouper. I don't know if it was Maui Maui. I don't know if it was orange ruffy. I don't know if it was cod. I don't know if it was flounder. I don't know if it was swordfish. Uh, but I guarantee you, whatever it was, it was Peter's favorite. Uh, and he gave him the best piece. Uh, he said, here, Peter, uh, hey, have some of this. Uh, and Peter's feeling unworthy. Uh, and he says, Peter, do you love me? Uh, he says, yes, Lord, I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Uh, he said, Peter, do you love me? Uh, yes, Lord, I love you. Uh, he said, feed my lambs. Uh, Peter, uh, got one more question for you. Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know it all things. You know it I love me. Uh, he said, feed my sheep. See, the Lord already forgiven Peter. He's trying to get Peter to forgive himself. He's showing him compassion and love. And can I say, when you hear the voice of God, it'll cause you to tremble. And you know what God's going to do? He's going to show you compassion and love because you're responding to his voice the approach is different can I say the Bible says draw nigh to God he'll draw nigh to you the Bible says that he's nigh them of a broken heart and save as such of a contrite spirit uh, Hey, when you indict him, when you come uh, uh, repetitiously, when you come uh, in vain, when you come selfishly, uh, you're actually being arrogant uh, towards God and he resisteth the proud but gives grace to the humble. Uh, and when you hear his voice uh, and you respond to his voice uh, and you become humbled before him realizing you don't deserve him uh, and you come and approach his throne that way, business is about to pick up. Why do you think we give an invitation after we preach? For you to respond to the voice of God. 
Now, can I say even in that, some people come to the altar out of habit. Some people come to the altar out of guilt. Few come passionately because they've heard the voice of God. But those that hear the voice of God and come passionately, God does something for them on the altar. We see the acknowledgement in Habakkuk's prayer. We see the approach in Habakkuk's prayer. But I want you to notice the asking in Habakkuk's prayer. Look what he asked for. Will somebody show me where he asked for a new car? Will somebody show me where he asked for a side of beef? Will somebody show me where he asked for the light bill to be paid? No, he didn't ask for anything temporary in these verses. But do notice what he asked for. A passionate prayer asks for things that changes eternity that changes lives that changes you let me say first of all he asked for revival look what he said he said oh lord I've heard thy speech and was afraid oh lord revive thy work in the midst of the years notice the first thing he says after he said I've heard your speech I now know what you've said to me I've been fearful after hearing your voice hearing your message notice the first thing he asked for he asked for a revival he asked for a change in heart of God's people he asked for revival now I know a lot of people ask for revival around here a lot of people pray God send revival but we don't pray passionately see our prayer for revival when we pray for revival is we pray for the church to be revived because we know revival is going to come through God's local church we pray that revival will change our community we pray that revival would break out and sinners would be saved and we pray for all these things but we're not truly praying passionately for revival we need to pray for revival of the soul we need to pray that our souls get revived. Not the church. What's the church made up of? A baptized body of believers. The church is people. But we need to pray that God will send revival to our souls. Because if we get revived in our soul, it will meet the need of our heart. A lot of times we pray God change our heart. No, we need him to change our soul. Because that will meet the need of our heart. We don't pray God change our souls. And God change our thinking and our hearing and our abilities. And God change our desires. And we, we pray God change our soul to do all those things. And it will meet the need of our hearts. Can I say? Revival will do three things for us. Revival will bring us into a life of unfailing confidence in God. If our souls get revived, it will produce in us a life of unfailing confidence in God. How many times do you hear people testify, pray for me, I begin to doubt whether or not God hears my prayers. I begin to doubt my salvation. I begin to waver in my faith. I begin to not trust God. I haven't done this. And you know what it is? It's a confidence problem. You know why it's a confidence problem? Because our soul needs to be revived. If your soul gets revived, it'll meet the need of your heart and it will develop in you a life of unfailing confidence in God. You know what will help your confidence and stop all your doubt? Revival of your soul. It'll stop all your doubt. Because once God speaks and sends revival to your soul, you'll never doubt him again. Hmm? I challenge you to find anybody in the scriptures that strayed from the things of God, that when God brought them back into a relationship with him, they ever wavered again. Show me where Peter ever wavered again after John chapter 20. Show me where Thomas ever doubted again after the Lord revealed unto him who he was. Hmm? Show me where David ever sinned with another woman after God restored unto him the joy of his salvation. Hmm? 
You show me anybody that ever failed the grace of God that they didn't get revived, be brought back into right relationship with God where they ever wavered again. Well, how come we got folks every time uh, uh, we have revival meeting, they got to be re-revived? How come we got folks that can stay away from church for four weeks, they come in, they shed crocodile tears, uh, they get up, walk out, and won't come back for another four weeks? I'll tell you what happened. Uh, hey, they were easing their conscience. They had remorse, but not repentance, my dear friends. Amen. There wasn't no revival of their soul. Their conscience got eased. Their egos got stroked because they come and they cried on the altar and uh, Clint come up and said, Oh, it's so good to see you. Oh, I went to church and everybody made over me. I got news for you. We are not to come to church to make over people. We're coming to church to worship Jesus uh, and make over Him uh, and to hear Him and let Him revive our souls. Amen. True revival of the soul will develop a life in you of unfailing confidence in God. If God ever truly speaks and you hear His voice and it puts the fear of God in your soul and He revives your soul, you'll never ever fail in confidence towards Him again. You'll know His voice and you'll know when He does speak and when He doesn't speak. Can I say, I've been in services when he speaks and folks know it and there are folks who don't know it and I've been in services when he didn't speak and there are folks acting like he did and they didn't know it wasn't God speaking you say what's the difference are you super spiritual no just one day I learned what his voice sounded like and I know when he's a speaking and I know when he's not speaking and revival of your soul will develop in your life an unfailing confidence in God. But revival will also bring to us a life, unre a life of unreserved commitment to God. If you truly get revived, you're not going to have a commitment problem anymore. Can I say, I don't know how many revival meetings we've had, but there's always some every revival meeting they are going to stand up, I'm going to do better. No, you're not. Because your soul didn't get revived. You're still trusting on the energy of the flesh and the arm of flesh will fail you, friend. Your flesh can't be committed to God. Your flesh hates the things of God. But if you ever truly are revived in your soul, uh, it will develop in you an unreserved commitment to God. Hallelujah. Huh? Again, there are folks, they can they not be here for a month and come in and act like uh, they've never missed a service. They give testimonies and they give prayer requests uh, and they uh, uh, go around and shake hands in fellowship. Uh, they don't act like Peter did on that ship when he heard the voice of Jesus. Uh, they don't act afraid that God's on the scene. Uh, they act like they're doing God a favor being on the scene. Uh, and then they're gone. And then they show up. Then they're gone. No commitment. Uh, I want to tell you, you ever get to Christ, he'll deserve, he'll uh, I put a desire for commitment in your heart and life. Yes. How come there are those? You never have to question whether or not they're going to be at church. I'll tell you because one day they heard his voice and he developed in their life an unreserved commitment to God. Can I say I don't have to come to church? Can I say I don't come to church because I'm the preacher? Can I say I come to church because I love Jesus? And I say, I was committed and loving on Jesus long before he ever called me to preach and long before he ever called me to pastor. Uh, I'm like Paul. I'm thankful he counted me faithful and put me in the ministry. But there's a key there. He counted me faithful and committed. Something he put in my heart. Uh, if he carried the, the weight of the world and put the sins of the world upon him up Calvary's mountain and yielded himself to the cross and was nailed and did that all for me, oh, do you think it's any problem for me to come to church when I don't feel good? Do you think it's any problem to come to church when, when, when you know, I've suffered some pain? I think about the real pain that he suffered and it's a joy to be able to come to church and worship him. I feel lost not being in church. That's why I got a real problem with folks that play church. Amen. I got a real problem with that. You say, Brother Doug, you saying they're not saved? I'm not saying that, but I will say they're not right with God. Amen. Hmm? 
I got a real problem with folks that, you know, they talk to you and they, they act like how happy they are in the Lord and everything and ain't been in church in a year. I got a problem with that. Hmm? They need revival in their soul. But how are they going to get revival in their soul when folks come and they sit here week in and week out and never hear the voice of God? Revival will bring to us a life of unwavering connection with God. It's an unwavering connection with God. You're in fellowship with Him. You hear His voice. You're connected to Him. You want the things of God in your life. There's some people come to church and they're trying, they're, it's almost like a work salvation. They're trying to prove their work to God. You can't. Because there's nothing in you that deserves God. But if you let Him revive your soul, it'll produce in your heart an unwavering connection to Him. Hmm? He asked for revival. But he not only asked for revival in this verse, he asked for something else. He asked for revelation. He said, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, make known. He's saying, God, not only send revival, but make known or reveal yourself. He's asking for revelation. He's wanting God to be made known everywhere. You know why people don't come to, uh, come to church? Because they've seen people. For every person they've seen that does have a touch of God in them and got the grace of God on their life, they've seen a hundred that claim they have that that don't. They've seen people. Huh? I have literally told people of our church that are no longer of our church when they're out in the world, don't tell people they come to our church. You say, Brother Doug, you're cruel. No, I, I was being as kind as I could. I was trying to open them up to the fact you don't live for God and I don't want people to know that you come to our church because you're an embarrassment to the name of Jesus. And you embarrass His church. We need folks to see Jesus not us Amen. Jesus Amen. that's why that banner's out there Amen. sir we would see brother Brian no sir we would see brother James no sir we'd see brother Todd Larry the cable guy no I've got the t-shirt not impressed no we would see Jesus and that's truly the only thing that'll get her done. Him. Amen. He says, make known. In the midst of years, make known. What's he wanting him to make known? He's wanting revelation. He's wanting people to see God. Hmm? Can I say we need to see a true revelation of God's majesty? We need to see his glory. We need to see his brilliance. Can I say, Hollywood's come a long ways. Now, I know I'm old, but I can remember when a sci-fi film, if you looked real good at the spaceship, you could see the wires. <laughs> With computerized special effects, the things now look real. Huh? They can actually shoot a scene, and it's got a big green screen behind them, and you don't know that because they've made a model of a city it's a, you know scale buildings this big and they've shot that model and put that person in front of that thing and then they blow up the city and you'd think they was in the city but they weren't there it's called special effects and people have seen special effects they've watched magicians make the Statue of Liberty disappear They've seen special effects. They've seen sleight of hand. And they look at the average church and they're not impressed. Why do you think Crossroads runs thousands? Because they put on a dog and pony show that impresses people. 
their Christmas programs, they swing people on cables through the air and all kinds of stuff. Look like they're really flying. They got Peter Pan and stuff going on in there. They come here, if we have a show, it's Glendale and Dougie. That's real impressive, isn't it? Huh? Has anybody seen that commercial about Pinocchio being a motivational speaker? <laughs> and he looks over at the one guy. I see potential. And his nose starts to grow. Listen to his voice and tell me that's not Thaddeus. His voice is Thaddeus. Listen to it. Close your eyes. Listen to that commercial. It's Thaddeus. I'm telling you, I've done Thaddeus and Glendale and Dougie for 20 years, and I know Thaddeus' voice, and it's Pinocchio. Huh? I always knew you had wood for a head. Huh? Listen to it. That's what it is. But we see them special effects. We can even see Pokey and Pinocchio without the strings now. I'm telling you, we don't have anything to offer that impresses people. We need God to bear His holy arms and reveal His majesty. Amen. They need to see Him. No? Nah? Listen, there's none of us in here as pretty as Joe Olstein. <laughs> Preachers, we ain't got that smile. We ain't spent a million dollars on our teeth. Huh? Listen, we don't have $2,000 Armani suits. You know, we can't put on the show that's going to impress people. They've seen that. Hmm? I want to tell you, there ain't nobody dressing as sharp as T.D. Jakes. They've seen it. Creflo Dollar, he spits poison out, but man, the guy looks sharp. My name was Dollar, I better have a few, huh? We're not impressive. But unfortunately, that's what we're relying on is us. We're relying on our intellect, our abilities, and as long as we, we want to rely on that, you know what God says? Well, go ahead, big boy. He's praying for revelation, a passionate prayer, praise for revival of the soul, and praise for revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What did Jesus say? And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Amen. We need the revelation of His majesty. They get a true glimpse of Him, they'll not want to wash windows, they'll want to bow at His feet. Can I say this? We need a true revelation of God's manifestation. We need to see His power. We need to see Him do the impossible. We need to see some Red Seas parted. We need to see some run back to the closet. We need to see uh, councils voting righteously. We need to see leadership and authority in this country that stands up for what is right. We need to see things that only God can do. Uh, and somebody needs to uh, uh, touch the throne of God with a broken heart and praying passionately uh, for God to reveal His mighty power in our midst. Amen. We need that revelation. So folks can see that God is on His throne. Amen. I'll say this. We need the revelation of His mindset. We need to know God's personage. We need to know what God really desires. What God's will really is. And why God loves sinners. We need that revelation. Hmm? We need more than just five or six people going out a week on visitation. You get a revelation of God's will and the whole church will be out. Inviting folks to church. Inviting folks to Jesus. We need revelation. See, as long as I tell you to do it, it's not going to matter. You're going to keep doing what you do. Nothing. But when you hear God speak it, Amen. and you see God reveal it, then you'll change. And God will do something in our midst. He prayed for one third and final thing. He prayed for revival. He prayed for revelation. But notice what else he prayed. He said, Revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember mercy. He prayed for God to remember. 
He prayed for God to remember why God showed up in the garden after Adam and Eve had sinned and cried, Adam, where art thou? Knowing where Adam was. Knowing that Adam was trying to cover his own sin. Knowing it was going to take the shedding of blood. He needs to remember why he had Noah build an ark when every imagination of man was evil continually. He needs to remember why he called Abraham, why he called Moses, why he made Israel his chosen people, why he went up Calvary's hill, why before that he prayed in the garden, not thy, my will but thine be done. He needs to remember uh, uh, what he did on the day of Pentecost uh, and what he's done in our forefathers' lives. Uh, those that were sown asunder and burned at the stake, how he still uh, propelled and perpetrated his church uh, and allowed us to hear the gospel. We need God to remember uh, in his wrath, mercy, Amen. and grace. You see, Habakkuk saw the handwriting on the wall. Habakkuk knew that when God showed up, he would either show up to judge or he'd show up to bless. We need to see the handwriting on the wall. Too many Christians, for whatever reason, choose not to realize how close we are. We need to ask God to remember so he doesn't show up to judge us, but he shows to bless us. Can I say when God shows up, he'll either punish or he'll pardon. When God shows up, he'll either slay or he'll soothe. When he shows up, he'll either discard or he'll deliver. When he shows up, he'll either light up or lighten up. When he shows up, he'll either turn away or turn to you and I. I don't want him to show up with Ichabod. I want him to show up with Emmanuel. We need him to remember his mercy. For him to remember not to give us what we deserve, but to give us what we need. And we need him and his marvelous, amazing grace. Habakkuk prayed passionately in chapter number 3. It was so effective, we're still talking about it 2,700 years later. We need to ask God to speak to us so we'll know how to pray passionately. Amen. So we'll know what to pray for. We don't need to run to an altar to impress God. He's not impressed. We need to run to an altar and ask God to speak. Give us ears to hear and feet swift to move and do what thus saith the Lord. We need to start praying passionately, not repetitiously. We need to start praying that it moves the heart of God instead of sickening the heart of God. God's not impressed with our prayer. He's not impressed with anything we offer. But He is impressed with what He does through us. God, help us to let Him speak and let him speak through us. That we'll pray what he wants us to pray. And ask for what he wants us to ask for. That we'll yield and fear and quiver. And that quivering represents there's a quaking of the things that he once wanted to now pray what God desired. We need God to absolutely speak to where we're afraid to breathe. I'll close with this. I have told this some times gone by, and I know that some of you just think I'm crazy. That's okay. There have been a few times in my life, one in particular I recall right now, I was a young preacher, had been preaching for 
five months. I really didn't know anything about preaching. I don't know much now, but I didn't know anything then. Thought I did, but I didn't know anything. And I was blessed to go to North Carolina for the first time in my life. Miss Mary, there was 16 of us preachers and my friend Ernie. You know who Ernie is. Doesn't wear shoes. You ever want to hear somebody pray passionately, hang around Ernie. Ernie's worth seven and a half million dollars. Now he's got shoes most of us would throw away and he wears clothes that we wouldn't wear. Now getting married helped Ernie a lot. He wasn't married back then and I'll never forget he's worth seven and a half million dollars. And the first stop we made because we all rode in church vans going to North Carolina to go to a camp meeting and the first stop, we stopped at a gas station, and Brother Ernie showed up with an empty two-liter bottle. And I'm thinking, why does Ernie have an empty two-liter bottle? But I've learned, don't ask Ernie, because he's going to tell you. And I just really don't have that much time. It's only an 11-hour trip where we're going. So he goes in, and he buys him a two-liter, and then he pours half of it in the empty two-liter bottle he had. And then he filled them both up with water, and he says, see, now I have two, mu- two of them, twice as much. I'm thinking it's all watered down, Ernie, and you're worth $7 million. You can't afford a dollar bottle of pop. Then we went to Burger King and ate. Now, listen, I'm I'm up for a good hamburger every now and then. Unfortunately, that's not Burger King, but we went to Burger King and ate. They got a good chicken sandwich, and it's Burger King. They asked Ernie to ask the blessing. When he got done thanking God for a sorry, no good Burger King cheeseburger, we couldn't eat because he touched heaven. It was broken hearted that he had enough money to buy a Burger King hamburger. I mean, he, he tore us up. Well, we got down there to North Carolina. And you can ask Miss Annette. I even told her. We wasn't even married yet, but I told her. I said, if I ever go back to North Carolina, I'm staying. Because it was some kind of camp meeting. I mean, I, I, I was blessed. I mean, it was something. It, it really did something. <laughs> Matter of fact, one preacher told me, he said, Brother Doug, he said, now when you go back up there, around Cincinnati, you can't preach like what you're hearing here. He said, they'll stone you if you preach like that up there. Well, I ain't been hit with a rock yet, but I've been trying to hack at it as much as I could. But listen, one day after the morning service, after preaching, after we ate, one of the preachers said, you want to go up to the mountain? I didn't know what they was talking about. And uh, about 16 of us said, yeah, we'll, we'll go to the mountain. I, I'm tagging along. I, that was my ride. I was going where they went. There's a preacher in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Pastors of church. His church is at the base of a mountain. And up on the top of the mountain, they'd build what we would know as old brush harbor. It, it's a, just a, a shell of a roof with the poles holding it up. Kind of looks like a pole barn with no no walls and up there they'd poured a concrete floor and they had pews up there and a piano and on Friday nights in the summer they had preaching and singing up there and they say it gets wild people go running off that mountain I mean when God's in it they go running off that mountain they never hit a tree they don't fall but they say when God's not in it somebody goes running off that mountain you can hear them rolling all the way to the bottom (laughs) well a few years before we got there Hurricane Hugo came through and they asked this preacher, said, aren't you worried about, you know, your mountain? And he said, ah, that's where God meets with his people. I'm not worried about that mountain. And we could see it when we were down there. That hurricane came to the base of that mountain. It tore up everything in its path. It got to that mountain. It split. It tore up everything on all sides of that mountain, come together on the other side, and continued on its path. Not one pew up on top of that mountain turned over. Up there on that mountain, they have a big boulder, and on that boulder, they painted Jeremiah 33.3. And that mountain is where I got the idea for our rock altar. That's where they put names on rocks, and when people get saved, they give them the rock with their name on it. People get right with God, they give them the rock with the name on it. Brother Gerald still has the rock (coughs) with his name on it. We got up there on that mountain, and, and, and the preacher's telling all that story and everything, and then it hits him. He says, it's time to pray. So we all got down in the leaves to pray. It was early spring. It was about this time of year. 
we all got down in the leaves and we got to praying and preachers got to calling on God and got to praying and everything. I don't know how long we was there. But all of a sudden, Brother Pete, I heard footsteps coming up behind us in them leaves. God's presence got so real on that place, I heard his footsteps. And Brother Lawrence, his presence was so overwhelming, we couldn't pray no more. And we were fearful to breathe. I was afraid to breathe. Afraid I'd grieve what God was doing on that mountain that day. We got done. After a while, God left. We all got up and sang a hymn. One of the preachers I was with. Hadn't been preaching much longer than me. He looked at me and he said, did you? And I said, mm-hmm. He said, enough said. What I'm trying to tell you is we need God to show up like that now. When God walks through here and we're afraid to breathe, then we'll know how to pray because we'll listen to His voice. We'll listen to what His desires are. And then his desires will become our desires. And he'll change our lives. I've had a few experiences, Miss Mary, with God and things like that that have changed my life. You know what's sad? is not everybody's had those experiences. But we all can. If we'll truly just start listening to his voice. So many of us want to help God out. He don't need our help. He don't need me to preach. He don't need you to testify. He don't need us to pray. He don't need anybody to sing. He don't need anybody to play any instruments. He don't need anything. He's God. He's the all-sufficient God. Amen. He took nothing and made everything. That's right. He doesn't Amen. need anything. But if we'll learn to listen to Him, He'll allow us to be used of Him in such a capacity people won't see us. They'll know it's from Him. There's a difference in somebody playing the piano and somebody anointed while they're playing the piano. There's a difference in somebody singing and somebody anointed with unction when they sing. There's a difference with somebody bringing an outline and somebody having unction on them when they preach. There's a difference when God meets with us. And praying passionately is all about God meeting and doing impossible. It starts with hearing Him and asking Him what He wants you to pray for. You see, Habakkuk wasn't indicting God anymore. Now he was praying passionately because he'd been with God. God help us to get with God so we can truly pray in a manner that moves the heart of God. Let's all stand. Will you come tonight and ask God to speak